Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's a delight to be here, although the time in, in the UK is, is quite, uh, quite, still quite, uh, quite early, but uh, it sounds as if you're having a, a great conference. So uh, well done to everyone who's uh, uh, had anything to, to do with putting this together. It, it's interesting, really, that when you put together something like, put a talk together like this for a conference, you, you're really never quite sure where to pitch the uh, where to pitch your talk um, and I've been reassured this morning listening to the the uh, magnificent presentations um, how much how many common themes there are and how much commonality there is between our experiences um, and what to, uh, um, what you're experiencing um, in India um, common things such as uh, mixture interpretation um, mixed profiles quality standards um, uh, and the the need for training and collaboration. So, um, with that, no further ado. Thank you so much for for inviting me. Um, it's an absolute delight to be with you, uh, and I'm very happy to follow up on any of the details in the presentation. So, I've le left my email address at the end. Um, so, please get in touch with me because um, the, the journey I and others have been on since around about 1995. Um, really needs to be shared it's it's you know the the, the difficulties the uh, the mistakes we made the successes we had really need to be shared so please get in touch and really the, the nuts of my um my talk um are to ask ourselves really where, where are we now um what do we think is around the corner um what do we all have to do in order to get the best from dna because uh, my experience is that it, it's not just about um what happens in the laboratory um it, it's a whole process that has to happen uh, um things like archiving material things like getting the uh, the, the legal system correct to uh, to make sure that we can collect the, the correct samples at the correct time and so i wanted to share with you some of the key messages along the uh, the way So many of you um, may be aware of this case. Where did this all of this DNA um, and crime start for us? Um, well, it started in around 1987, um, pre to previously to the, the DNA database, um, and this was, as, as many people will know, the uh, the, ver the very first case, uh, the, the pitchfork case. It, it was called, um, and I put an image. There's, there's usually a rather iconic image of what pitchfork looked like at the time. Um, he's now been in prison for a good number of years, uh, but he's, I understand he's being released um, on on day license, so he's released daily, um, and I believe that that's a picture uh, that was taken of him. Um, so you, you can read the, uh, the, the the slide for yourself. Uh, I mean, at the time we we had the, the standard uh, serological tests, uh, which of course were um, were not very good for inclusion. They were very good for excluding people. Uh, but you, you'll see all the way through my presentation, I've tried to, to pitch this at a, a number of audiences, uh, both the scientific uh, and the legislators. And, and I'm hoping that we've, uh, in, in the audience today, we've got a mixture of senior police officers, scientists, and, and people who as a community can get together uh, to make this uh, an even more powerful tool. Uh, but the key message in, in this uh, part of the story uh, is, is that DNA exonerates the, the innocent as well as identifying the guilty. You will see at point number six there uh, that during this series of, of, of cases, this series of murders, um, uh, an innocent person just happened to confess for whatever reason, I, I don't know, but Richard Buckland, you can see, um, confessed is uh, uh, to committing one of the, uh, the offences. Um, Professor Sir Alec Jeffries was able to say that, well, the, the offences were connected, the, the offences were genetically connected, uh, but Buckland would, would confess to only one of these crimes only. So the, the key message there is um, that the power of science, the power of DNA uh, is there for the purposes of justice, it's for the purposes of exonerating the, the innocent, um, as well as identifying the, the guilty. Uh, and, and again, just to reflect a little bit on, on Dawn um, and Linda, um, who were murdered all those years ago now. Um, they would now be around 50 years of age, mums, grand, grandmothers, um, and so forth. So we, we really never ought to forget the, um, the, the effect that this uh, has, the power of DNA to um, 
to give closure to victims. Um, what would have happened to Richard Buckland? You know, he might well have still been in prison. Um, and my, my key point on, on that slide is that the advances in science do not diminish the, the need for professional investigators. Um, it's not one versus the other, science versus traditional policing. Um, it's about everyone getting together because more science equals the need for uh, better uh, and, and more professional investigators in, in my experience. Um, so again, I'm, I'm not going to dwell too much on this because um, again, I'm not wasn't quite sure what the makeup of the audience was. Um, but we've heard a lot this morning about autosomal DNA, autosomal STR analysis, which um, really forms the background and the backbone of, of DNA testing in our country. Um, and of course, ar around the world uh, in, in, a, in a criminal context, in any event. Uh, but there, there are similarities between siblings. Um, and I'm hoping that you can see um, these publications that we, we put together at the time of, of well just a little bit after putting after the database went live when we were looking at cold cases actually how could we look back at these cases um to re to reinvestigate them uh, and actually how could we use the similarity between siblings so we, we heard earlier on one of the speakers saying uh, that of course that there, there is a, you know, a lot of uh, divergence between different individuals profiles uh, but there is similarity between siblings what we did, we, we found that um, putting these guide, this guidance together, putting the training together alongside the rollout of the, the scientific databases um, was really key to, uh, um, to, to try to help make things better. And, and we, we learned an awful lot of, um, uh, along the way. We learned an awful lot from, from doing these, uh, these, these projects. Um, so this really is, is still the, uh, the process. This is where we get our... Um, forensic DNA from, um, from the individual, from uh, the nucleus of the cell, from the chromosome and the, the, those particular polymorphic areas on the chromosome um, that we use uh, now in the UK uh, and colleagues use around the world. We can deal, of course, with, with lots of samples. And, and the, again, the, the key message here is that these have become a, a much more rich source of, of DNA. Um, in the very early days of DNA, we had to recover, extract a piece of DNA around about um, 2.5 centimetres in diameter uh, in order to generate a profile. Uh, and you'll hear me say nowadays what the, uh, the starting uh, threshold is. So we, uh, in, in the criminal context, get DNA from all of these um, samples. They are, of course, very good uh, for DNA is very good for both property crimes uh, and crimes against the person, rape, sexual offences, uh, murders, etc. Um, but the key message here is that our ability to extract DNA from these samples um, is ever advancing, and that we can extract better and better um, quality DNA from these crime samples. Um, the new multiplexes are far better in dealing with inhibition, inhibition um, and of course that uh, will continue to, to increase, as I say there. But the question I ask rhetorically is, what does this mean for legislators, scientists, investigators, and above all, victims? We must never forget that all of this, uh, all of our endeavours um, are about making life better for the criminal justice system, making life better for the victims of crime, uh, and where need be, incarcerating the, the guilty uh, and freeing the innocent. Um, but remember, uh, and again, through this uh, this whole um, journey from 95 onwards, um, we will not get the best out of science uh, unless really all parties embrace um, and support and actively drive this, uh, uh, this technology. Um, DNA matches alone will, will not lead to, to crime being solved. Um, that's when we, we pass over the, um, you know, the, the relay baton um, to the next part of the, the criminal justice process that the police service and of course then the uh, the, the judiciary uh, and of course we need police officers who are able to to understand uh, appreciate the, the science um, and judges and, and lawyers uh, who can can work with the, uh, uh, the the outputs so again it really needs everyone to, to play a part and, and that's not just me 
uh, sitting here and saying that it's really our experiences from launching the database in 1995 from the government, our government spending around about 280 million pounds on expanding the database um, and all the, the, uh, um, the, the, the tips and techniques, the, the pitfalls we, we faced along the way. And so STRs for, for us uh, looks set to uh, to stay within the uh, certainly within the foreseeable future. Um, you can see that we have the standard way of, uh, of extracting, uh, quantifying, amplifying, and, and separating DNA. Um, but nowadays, um, separation um, and interpretation um, seem to be more problematic than perhaps they uh, they, they were. We are beginning to see some uh, more, more phenotypical advancements, but for the moment, as I've said, um, STRs looks here to, to stay. Um, but as you'll see, sensitivity and discrimination, I'll go on to speak about that in more detail, uh, has shown a, a massive uh, increase over my, my time with the, um, in DNA. And so this is really a potted history of um, where we, we started in uh, 1985, round about the, the pitchfork era. Uh, you saw earlier on that, uh, that very first murder case um, using forensic DNA, 1985, there or thereabouts. Um, moving on to SLPs, uh, single locus probing, probes, um, and really then the, the, the first thoughts of what type of, of um, multiplex can we use when we come to, to think about launching a database. Um, in actual fact, quad was, was never used, um, but the, the sixplex, the, the STR profiling using SGM, second generation multiplexing, um, launched in 1995. Uh, and that was the um, the, the multiplex of, of the time, as I said, you can see that in 95, the database went live and there have been advances uh, along the way. 1999, uh, we had we moved to a 10 plex. Um, so we moved from the six to the 10 uh, because we, we found rather early on um, as the numbers on your, your database gets large, get larger, um, the more you need to put um, additional measures in to improve discrimination. Um, we moved in 2000 to uh, what was called at the time low copy number, um, nowadays called low template number DNA, um, basically replicating DNA uh, more than the, the standard 28 uh, cycles of PCR, although there are other ways of, of replicating DNA uh, other than enhanced PCR cycles. Um, so getting more and more from less and less. Um, then we moved to... Uh, this concept of familial DNA searching, not too dissimilar from what we see nowadays with, uh, you know, the, the gen genetic genealogy type uh, methods. Uh, but we, this was these was our uh, uh, this was our guidance where we could use similarities between people who were on the database um, with offences committed by family members who were not on the database, um, sometimes referred to as reverse uh, genealogy. Um, so looking for um, for parents through children and so forth. And you, you'll see, uh, I'll give you an example in a moment of how that, uh, um, that played out. Uh, and then in around about 2012, um, the template um, was replaced by DNA 17. Um, and looking across the globe now, uh, we see these multiplexes uh, advancing very much in terms of uh, the number of STR markers that we, uh, we, we uh, have in place. And of course, these are all more, more robust to inhibition. Uh, they all work with um, higher and lower molecular weights in DNA. Uh, but it's not uncommon now to see 21, 23, 24, tw and 27 plexes uh, around the, the globe. But of course, the, the, going back to the point I was saying earlier on about, you know, we, we need to, uh, uh, to, to take the legislators with us um, in order to uh, to build a database and I certainly heard one of the commentators this morning talking about you know we, we don't have a database um, well if you are thinking of a database these are uh, things which must be considered because um, when we started in 1994 um, you need a law to to allow you to take samples um, and who are you going to sample from who are these individuals who are you going to take your your reference samples your buckle scrapes from 
Uh, and that was set out in the, in the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act of 1994. And I won't bore you with each of these, these amendments, um, but as, we, as they've increased, um, as, they've got, as time's gone along, um, there have been various uh, adaptations. Um, in the, the early days, um, we took samples, reference samples from a smaller number of, um, you might call them catchment individuals, people who were going to be sampled for, for DNA. Um, murderers, of course, uh, sexual criminals, uh, people who broke into houses, car crime, I think was one. Um, and there was that, that third catch-all, um, which said something along the lines that if the police, if, if there has been a recordable crime committed um, and a police officer suspects the individual might have been involved with that or uh, uh, that crime, then a sample can be taken. And again, I'm going to give you an example of, of you know, what that how that played out and, and what lessons we learned from that. So we went all the way through then to uh, keeping samples on the database all the time. So once a, once a reference sample was taken, it would be kept there uh, all the time. Um, and that was okay until around about 2012 with the Protection Freedoms Act, um, where the government said, actually, we need to take the samples off if the person, after a certain time, um, the samples will come off the database. So this has been an evolutionary process, an evolution both in terms of science and in terms of the legislation. Um, so again, you will hear me talk about the importance of, of the, the need for proportionate laws uh, to be developed pre-launching a database. Um, and as we move through, that will collect what we refer to as the active criminal population. And then I'll come back to talk on that through a a topic of active criminal population in, in a moment. Because this was one of the, the very, very, very early cases. Um, you, you heard me say that the database went live in 95. Um, and at the time, the samples under the legislation at the time, if the person was acquitted, um, the sample should have been taken off the database. That was the, uh, the, the key, the background to this message. You can see the case for yourself. It involved a, uh, an attempted robbery. Um, S was a, a, a juvenile, so was not was not been identified uh, at the time. He was as it, as is the law in the UK. Fingerprints and DNA were taken. Uh, he was acquitted, um, and the crux of this is that um, the samples should then have been uh, taken from expunged from the database. Um, and uh, that they weren't um, due to some, some mix up, due to some, uh, some error, some oversight, the sample was left on um, and it then went on to match uh, against some rather serious offences after this, if you see what I mean, so after 2001, the sample was still left on the database, uh, S and Marple were acquitted, uh, but the sample then went on to match against, I think, very serious uh, rape offences. And of course, the lawyers said, well, you, you should not have had this data. You shouldn't have had this profile in, in the first place. Um, our uh, Court of Appeal upheld that. He went to our Supreme Court, who also upheld the, uh, the, the common sense of, of doing that. OK, it, it was a, an error, um, but the, the overall good meant that we, uh, we, we kept this, uh, the, this sample on the database. And um, it went all the way to the European Court, where it was absolutely actually deemed uh, unlawful so um, the samples that sample was taken off um, but again the key message here is that we need to have a, a prolific offenders what we call pro prolific offenders who are on the database at the ascent of their criminal career so when they're on the, the ascent of, of their, their crime spree we need to have, have them on the database so they can match against subsequent cases um, and, and again, I'll give you some examples of, of that. Um, it's interesting when I was at the Home Office, I would see the, the, the DNA matches every week. Um, and there was somewhere in the order of about 180, sorry, 840, pardon me, 840 every week um, of matches of, for, for murders, for, for rapes, sexual assaults, uh, and a whole raft of other crimes. And that was every week. And so, um, these were some of these who would have thought it type uh, um, uh, occasions. Um, when, I said, when we first started with the, the DNA database, uh, we thought, well, who should we sample from? This person was sampled from a category of offences that, that would not necessarily have been, uh, been profiled, would not necessarily have had a sample taken. 
You can see he was arrested for stealing groceries uh, in 2001, um, actually not too far now from, from where I work. Um, and the, the police officer had the, uh, the wherefore to say, well, you know, I, th I think this person might have done a committed other offences. Um, I'll sample him. And uh, he went on to, to match against, you can see there's some, some very serious um, sexual offences uh, back in, uh, in 1988. Um, so the key message there is um, sometimes we, we, we label, sometimes I'm thinking that if we've got police officers in the audience, we sometimes label uh, offenders as thieves, drug offenders, etc. <clears throat> but, but think of these more widely, think of these as um, more opportunist. Um, this was a person who, yes, was thieving, uh, but was also committing uh, sexual offences. So the, um, the issue of the years has been getting more DNA from, extracting more DNA from, from smaller and smaller and smaller samples. Um, it's not uncommon nowadays to, for us in the UK to be able to recover usable DNA really from, from any garment that touches the skin, uh, from, from a watch strap, from uh, the, the arms of spectacles. Because the, um, I said earlier on, the, the, uh, those early um, samples, we would have to start with somewhere in the order of about 2.5 centimetres of DNA um, to begin the, to initiate the process. That's become smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and now we're to the point where we get to a uh, starting material from around 500 picograms. Uh, we've had examples where um, we've had uh, starting material from around 200 picograms. Um, and that, the, the, the word I use there is game changer because it is a game changer. Uh, it's a game changer in both in terms of uh, the, the need for quali proper quality standards, uh, the need for proper, proper anti-contamination procedures. Um, and this is really a sea change in terms of laboratory cleanliness uh, and so forth and of course the, the other thing now whereas previously we could be quite sure of uh, certain of what the, the that, that starting material was um, nowadays um, we can just say well it's cellular material uh, we may not really understand how what the, that transfer mechanism was uh, or indeed um, how long the DNA might have persisted uh, so the question I pose to all of the, the, the conference, um, all of the, the scientific policing legislative community uh, in India and around the world is, are we ready for this? And just to give you some example of some idea of, of what the starting material is nowadays from this, this, the early days, you can see there that the four gram pack of, of sugar divided into the, the single, uh, single dose, if you will, Single crystal uh, of sugar is around about a milligram. Divide that by a thousand gives us a nanogram. Divide that again by a, peak, uh, a thousand gives us one picogram. Um, and I've heard of examples where 200 picograms of this level of material, where it's in, in good quality, uh, has initiated the, the process. 500 is, is, is the standard nowadays um, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the UK. But of course, increasing sensitivity, uh, which has been the, the, the focus and the drive for, in my experience, for, uh, for, for a number of years now, does increase this risk of ad adventitious transfer or contamination. Um, one of the things we did in the UK when we launched our database uh, was to go national with a, a series of training sessions for police officers, for people who are going to take samples. Um, and I think probably there's a need to revisit that uh, now that, we, as I say, we've, we've had this game changer. Um, so what we've added to, you can see the, you, you will have all have seen these, these DNA profiles. Um, again, we, we exploit these similarities. We exploit the fact that we inherit 50% DNA from mum and half from dad. Um, and that looks similar, like, likely to, to stay. But excuse me a moment. Sorry guys, one of the, the downsides of having the, the cat in the, in the room when you're trying to, to present. So what does look quite certain um, is that we will continue to exploit these uh, similarities, uh, exploit them in, in a way that 
and you know we can put work together like this um we can exploit the similarities between parents and children um, uh, and, and their siblings um and again if, if anyone wants copies of, of these documents uh, i have them and of course the new newer multiplexes are now much much better able to deal with degradation and inhibition um and again um certainly our early speaker talked about the, the fungal growth on on some of those those garments which uh, which might at some point be uh, be better looked at by, by by some of the new multiplexes. Um, so why do we need a database? Um, well, many of our criminals tend to be repeat offenders, both in their early teens. Um, not every member of the society. I'm not being, not by any means, but certainly criminal criminals have a tendency to be repeat offenders. Criminals have a tendency to fall back into crime. Um, we found through this this work that we did with uh, with cold case rape investigation um, that our rapists had around about ninety percent of ninety percent had previous convictions for for lesser offences. We call them precursor offences often. Armed robbers had a greater than a fifty percent chance of criminal record. Um, and uh, again, I'm going to give you an example later of a serial offender, and, and just ask us all to reflect on. What could we have done better? What could we have done better for uh, for society? So the key message there for um, for everyone um, is that if we don't seize the opportunities to act on these individuals at the time, uh, they may very well continue to reoffend and re-victimise. Uh, and and this is one of the such cases. This was a. Uh, a person who was committing his offences in the UK um, around about 2001. Um, and for those of you who've been to the UK, um, there's a large orbital road that, that runs around the, uh, the capital. It's called the, the M25. If you've ever driven into, if you've ever flown into Heathrow, um, it's the road that you'll go around to, uh, to either get into London uh, or to get, um, get out to the, uh, the, the, uh, the counties, the shires. Um, and this man was committing his offences um, around this, this ring of uh, um, this, this motorway ring. Um, and eventually, of course, the defender was, was captured um, and lots of, of, of good press and, and good you know, satisfaction stories for, for victims. Um, but I ask us all to reflect, you know, did we do enough? Did we, could we have done better? Because if you look um, look at this little table that I, I put together, um, and if you look at the, the column two, you can see that I've calculated the, the days between each of these offences. Um, and uh, you can see that the first offence um, committed on a, um, a girl, you can see that the victims, <coughs> pardon me, that, that, ver that first victim was 10 years of age. Um, now, the point I'm making here about having your active criminal population on the database is that you know with with science we could have never stopped, um, God forbid, that, that first offence. Uh, not with not with science, uh, but if we had have had that individual on the database um, after at the time, can you see that the offence on the eleventh of June, um, the sixteenth of June, the sixteenth, the sixth of August, the seventh of August, eighth of September, etc., would not have been committed. Um, and you can see all of the victims that their ages, um, the 13 year old, the 14 year old victim, the, the, the 52 year old victim. Um, so you can see really the, the importance of, of capturing these people at the time of their, uh, their, their offending. <coughs> and of course this, this is backed up by, by good science, uh, but the point I make is, is that science alone um, doesn't, uh, is not the answer to everything. <coughs> An organisation that came after us um, was the National Police Improvement Agency, and they examined murders in 2009 to 2010 uh, and looked at the contribution of forensic science. Um, and you can read for the, the you can read the, the numbers for yourself. <coughs> Pardon me, but they said that sort of fingerprints were used in um, around about three quarters, uh, footwear marks used in over 33%. Um, and DNA used in great amounts in, in murders and, of course, in, in sexual offences. So um, it's it's very powerful stuff. Um, but it, it, again, once again, it can't be fully exploited unless we have a 
fully joined up support drive um, and investment uh, from from government and it requires buying it requires understanding from from lawyers it, it relies on understanding by, by the judiciary um, and believe me uh, having lived this journey um, DNA has the power to revolutionize crime investigation um, despite the fact that we, we have some great successes um, I think we only utilize what I sometimes refer to as the tip of the iceberg um, we could do much more I, I feel well, one of the other things we did also was to, to build some um, some some models that, that showed the the, um, the value of forensic science one of the things we often struggle against um, certainly when talking to to government officials and legislators um, is you know that the politicians want to know what is the return on my investment if I invest you heard me saying in the UK, 280 million pounds in the advancement of DNA. What is this going to give me for my uh, for my, my pound or uh, or the currency? Uh, and one of the things you can do with with forensic science with with DNA, it, I've always said that it, it's very tangible. You can see how much crime you have. You can see how I've given you an example of um, 275,000 burglaries. Uh, that was at the time in the UK. Um, so put this into some context, 750 odd uh, victims per day. We knew how many crime scene examinations we took and how, therefore how many visits we were taking. We knew what the DNA recovery rate was. We knew what the fingerprint recovery rate was. And of course, very early on, when you launch your database, um, you establish what the matching efficiency is. Um, so can you see this, this stepwise approach uh, will able you, enable you to say, well, for this investment, um, I'm going to get this amount of, uh, of value. <clears throat> but of course, the key message there is that the providing a match is not the end of the process. Um, we then need um, professional, uh, skilled investigators to actually take take the baton forward um, and convert the, these outputs, these, these the outputs of a scientific laboratory, the outputs of DNA, uh, into uh, professional value and. and uh, and outcomes, um, you know, people arrested, people incarcerated and the like. Uh, the, the other key message there is that nowadays, the speed at which we can generate DNA profiles, and you'll hear me say in a moment that the standard turnaround for DNA now in, in the UK, I only checked last week, um, is, is four days. Uh, so the, the standard turnaround for submitting, submitting a sample to uh, to, to um, for profiling, for, to have the, the sample analysed um, and the profile then submitted to the database um, under the <coughs> under current procedures is standard for uh, th uh, three to five days. Uh, and again, that key message, science doesn't diminish the need for skilled investigators, it enhances it. But of course, if we can't deal with these matches, if we can generate these matches, the <coughs> In quick time, um, we we need people to be able to handle them. Otherwise, we just get a never ending a never ending queue. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, I mentioned to you that we we um, had uh, low template DNA around about um, uh, 2000, 2002. and in experimenting with with this, um, enhancing the site the number of PCR cycles as we did it at the time. Um, we were able to generate some profiles on a, some bomb components from a, a very serious offence in, in, in Ireland. Um, and it would be fair to say that you can see that the judge criticised the, the use of low template DNA um, for, for a number of reasons. Um, he said that it had not been peer reviewed. Um, it was susceptible to contamination, which he's, he's right. Um, and of course, there needs to be you know, much better processes for handling um, contamination. Um, and he said that, that, that Parliament should have debated this. Well, my understanding is, is that um, science will advance more rapidly than the legislative process. Uh, but of course, it is important to take the politicians with us, uh, but actually not let them impede the, the advance of, of science. Um, so you, you've heard me, me say this already, the, the starting threshold is now around about 500 picograms. Um, with, oh, that's over and above the, the previous um, templex um, system we had previously. Uh, <coughs> and we can get um, 
uh, around about the DNA from around about 80 cells for the, the standard test. But, uh, and again, one of our previous speakers talked about, the, the, the showed an example of a mixed profile. One of the problems we, we have nowadays um, is that lots of our crime samples, um, not of course the reference samples, we wouldn't expect those to be, um, to be mixed. But this really is the picture now for, um, speaking with someone last week, they, they were telling me that this is not unusual, not, this is not an unusual picture to see uh, for each of the samples that we take from a, from a crime scene. So, of course, that, those, that issue of, of mixtures really needs to, to be addressed now. And, and I, thankfully, we, we're seeing lots of, um, starting to see lots of, of uh, research on mixture interpretation. So, going back to um, our co case program, um, we said, well, what can we do if we've invested all of this money in the database? Uh, we put the samples onto the database and we don't get a match. Uh, yes, we can, <clears throat> we can do nothing, we can wait for the offender to re offend. We've seen that if they continue to reoffend, of course, they continue to, to make more victims. So in here, we, we put together these, this, uh, the, these techniques for using familial searching. Uh, and you can see there that we, we, the way in which we, we use uh, familial searching in the UK uh, is to search for uh, the gene genetic relationship between parents and children, um, sometimes referred to as reverse genealogy. Um, and the similarity between siblings. So we all would share a similarity between our siblings. Uh, and, and that's the difference between us really now and what we're seeing in the US um, with the use of, of, of GEDmatch. We start with people who are on the database and we look for similarities uh, in their families uh, to actually provide us with investigative links. Uh, whereas <coughs> the, the US, the, the genetic genealogy uses a proprietary um, 23andMe ancestry.com type uh, um, type databases. Okay, so so this was mindful of time. This was the the very first um, case worldwide where we used um, uh, familial DNA. Um, this was a girl who was murdered in 1973. The case had been been unsolved for, for many years. Uh, it was linked with another case, of course, um, and. We knew that the cases were matched, but we didn't know who was on the database, uh, who it was. We didn't know who the offender was um, because we had no match. Um, so these offences remained unsolved for 29 years. Um, the girl's underwear was stored in the laboratory. Um, there were no matches. Uh, and in 2000, uh, the South Wales Police launched Operation Magnum uh, to say, well, look, we, we know that we don't have a match on the database, uh, but are there any close matches? Are there anyone who's a sibling or a, 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 a child of this individual. Um, so a number of, of samples were, uh, uh, were, were re-looked at. So the key message, what we, we've learned over the years is make sure your archiving policy is well established. Again, I think one of the other speakers spoke about this. Forensic scientists, scientists in general are, are very good at archiving material, uh, but make sure that this is, a, if we're thinking about launching a database, look back as well as forwards. <coughs> We need to look back to, to potentially deal with old cases as well as cases that might happen in the future. So in 2000, again, the, the very first time this had been used worldwide and hats off to, to everyone who was involved with this. Um, some amazing police work uh, done by officers in, uh, in sorry, South Wales Police. Sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Robert. Dr. Robert yes. Can you conclude yeah. fast? Yes, okay. Um, Thank you. It was, it was reduced to 200 uh, possibles um, and a local car thief was, uh, was arrested uh, and eventually jo uh, Joseph Kappen, the, uh, the offender, was, uh, was arrested, uh, so was, was exhumed, sorry, and that was the first worldwide. Um, so we learned an awful lot from Operation Advance, the, the cold case work. Um, what did it show us? Um, it showed us that if we don't act quickly, um, we'll uh, we, we'll uh, give the opportunity for other people to, to offend. Um, you can see there that this is the trajectory of criminals' careers. So the violent sexual offender uh, has a rather um, exponential trajectory. Um, so you can see the frequency of offending up the, uh, X, the Y axis uh, and the age of offenders. Uh, the more normal bell shaped curve is the, the normal uh, acquisitive criminal, uh, the exponential 
line is the violent and sexual offender. So the point there is, is if we don't seize that opportunity, uh, we put more victims at risk. Um, and if we fail to act, um, then we increase the, the chance of more victims. Um, the new multiplexers will provide more possibilities. They are more sensitive, um, but with that comes uh, the issue of mixture interpretation. Uh, more recovery equals more matches, more follow-ups needed by the police and follow-ups in real time. This is the very latest from the USA. Um, this is a, an adaptation of, of our uh, uh, cold case work, uh, but using now the, the GEDmatch um, preparatory databases. There, I've put you a, uh, a little study guide in there, and there's a link to, to that at the bottom. Um, I was looking only last week at the um, one of these cases. And, and how DNA is advancing now to, to you know, be able to recover DNA from, as it says here, a, a, single, um, a single hair. Rapid hit, I think we've, uh, people will, will know of, um, but again, it's the, the key message there is, you know, do we have the chance to, to react to these things in real time? Um, so the future, um, again, I think I heard speakers talk about uh, next gen, uh, MPS, the more use of genetic genealogy, um, the ongoing focus and drive for quality, uh, next generation sequencing, mixture interpretation um, is going to be a, a key factor for, for us all. Um, 20, 27 plates in, uh, in China. Um, <clears throat> and again, people might have even seen this, um, this um, screenshot um, of how uh, in Hong Kong, um, it's alleged, um, I don't know what the, uh, I've not seen the signs behind this, but it's alleged that people who drop litter on the street uh, can have their, their phenotype uh, profiled uh, and produce a, a picture of what they, uh, what they look like. So that was a very quick ramble through. I'm, I'm sorry I went slightly over, uh, but please, if I can be of any help, we've trod this path um, and it, so it, it would be nice to try to help people, the people not to, to repeat some of the uh, uh, the, the mistakes we, we made um, and achieved some of the, the massive successes that we had along the way. So thank you, everyone.